السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin in the name of Allah and we send blessings and our praise upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the blessed companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So we begin today our fifth session of walking with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as part of our summer seerah uh, of 2022 to look today at the diet of the Prophet ﷺ. Last time we looked at more of the peculiarities of the Prophet ﷺ with respect to some of his more notable mannerisms uh, across his life, um, anywhere from his eating to just his prayers to his very existence. And some of those things that really distinguished him and which we can still benefit from here and now. Uh, but uh, with respect to today, we're going to be talking about more with respect to his diet, his eating habits, and we'll be talking how uh, these are discussed in the Shamail. Uh, it's not by any means conclusive or that which is, you know, at the uh, you know, finite by any means, but uh, it gives us an idea into the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that if we're walking alongside the Prophet ﷺ, uh, what, what, what did he like to eat? What was it like for him? Um, what was the Uh, concept of eating meals and and all of that. What was that like to be around him and to be with him and to see that? So let's picture ourselves uh, at this moment, having over the past few weeks gotten to know the Prophet ﷺ in different ways with respect to his lifestyle, his clothing, his mannerisms. Imagine being invited to a meal with him. Um, and now we're sitting with him and we have the chance to observe not only his dietary habits, but also the way in which he eats, the manner in which he partakes of food and how he infuses his, his, his faith with respect to this experience. And we know already the concept of the process of and the Uh, being of the Prophet ﷺ in various gatherings and what those gatherings were like, the uh, respect the Prophet ﷺ would afford people, the fact that he wouldn't expect a red carpet rolled out for him or uh, a specific seat designated for him at any point in the gathering, that he would just be someone who uh, would would fit in anywhere that uh, that has space. And but his his lasting impression on those around him would be that each of them felt as if they were the most important person to him regardless of who they were how far away they were from him or whatnot but that these would be blessed gatherings and he would be there with full intentionality so today we put ourselves back in these gatherings uh but specifically with from the lens of looking at the diet of the process of what he ate and how he ate it and and all of these things here so uh, as always we begin and dive in with various narrations that are mentioned in the Shamail book that we are going through. So there are a number of things that we don't cover in this book that are mentioned in other narrations or other traditions or other compilations. So this is by no means exhaustive, but it, it gives at least a good insight for one to kind of have a appreciation for these aspects within the Prophet's life. And again, as I mentioned, there's so many other sources and so many other places where uh, things that the Prophet ﷺ liked to eat are mentioned or how he liked to eat some things or some things that uh, he may not have preferred or anything like that, um, you know, giving some more insight with respect to his dietary habits uh, that, that are beyond this as well. So to begin with our discussion here, The first hadith we lift up comes from Anas ibn Malik. And he lifts up that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said that Allah is pleased with the servant who, when that person eats, they uh, they praise Allah for it. And when they drink from their, their drink that has been given, they praise Allah for it. So again, thinking about setting the foundation, we're sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In this gathering, we've been invited uh, to eat with him and to be in this this uh, share this meal with him, and uh, remembering that it's this is not a disconnected experience from the ritual worship that we have. It's not a disconnected experience from salah. It's not a disconnected experience from any other part of faith. That just as intentional as we are in these other spaces, or we're supposed to be in these other spaces, so too we should be mindful and attentive, especially in those spaces where we sometimes get fixated on a worldly desire or something that gives us immediate benefit uh, in favor of, uh, as opposed to not giving that due to Allah. And so the Prophet lifts up this, that um, the importance of needing to give praise to Allah 
for when you eat and when you drink, that having a law on the forefront of your mind is part and parcel to any meal or any engagement with food, because it reminds you that uh, you don't just live to eat, but you eat to live, that you are more than just, you know, this meal or, or this meal is not definitive or anything like that, uh, but it, it is a means of sustenance. But the one who is providing it is the one to whom your thoughts and your praise and all your concern is actually due there. Uh, next hadith comes from Hisham ibn Urwa, who says that mention Allah's name, or the Prophet said, mention Allah's name, eat with your right hand, and eat from what is nearest you, giving uh, advice to another companion to, again, keep Allah at the forefront, but the etiquette with which to eat, to not eat with your left hand, eat with your right hand, and eat from what is closest to you. Don't just stretch out or whatnot, try to dominate the table. Take from what is already, already near you. Uh, Anas also says that the Prophet uh, lifted up, the, or the Prophet never ate upon a small table or from a small plate. That the Prophet used to eat on round mats, and it's also narrated that the Prophet never uh, did not eat upon a small table or even eat thin bread until he passed away. So, uh, thinking that the Prophet's manner of eating, where he would eat, wouldn't be on a table or anything fancy like this. That if we were eating with the Prophet, we can expect to be sitting on the ground. We can expect to be having a meal that's very shared, but also where no one's above each other, no one's up, no one's down. Everyone is on a level plane, but that we're all sitting uh, together here. Uh, Aisha Radullah Anha relates that when one of you, uh, that the Prophet lifted up, that when one of you eats and forgets to mention uh, Allah's name over their food, let them say, in the name of Allah, in the, in the beginning and in the end. So again, mindfulness, that you're not just here to stuff yourself. You're not just here to uh, satiate your, your hunger. You're here as well, uh, and your responsibility is to be mindful. In uh, Salman ibn Farsi also relates that the Prophet mentioned the blessings of food are gained through purification performed prior to and after eating. So washing your hands, cleaning uh, yourself in this aspect, making yourself prepared for this food. This is a blessed experience and the blessings of this food are gained through this purification that uh, it's not just something to be discarded with. So the act of Eating, the act of having a meal is something sacred, is something that we shouldn't take for granted, that it has its own etiquette uh, with respect to how to approach it, and that these etiquettes and these approaches have blessings to them, both before and after. In the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, uh, we see how it's shared that despite the extreme poverty and the extreme hunger the Prophet ﷺ would face, as well as his family, so many times in their life, and so often that at times, they would only have some, maybe some dates to eat or something that's old. But the Prophet ﷺ would always be generous, and he would distribute his food to his fellow companions when they would come for a meal or if they would come to eat before eating anything himself. Again, this is not this was not a person that sought to be a king. This was not a person that sought to be a ruler. This was someone who was a messenger of Allah, and and part and parcel of his actions are a testament to that, that when he would gather his companions, understanding that the, these morsels of food that they have might be the last that they see for some time, at least for the rest of the day, but yet still giving preference to those who are uh, guests and giving that that uh, that ethic of taking care of those who uh, are, are, are different from you, who are others in this aspect. Jabir ibn Abdullah shares that the Prophet ﷺ forbade that one should eat with their left hand. We talked about how the Prophet ﷺ commanded to eat with the right hand, but to forbid explicitly to using the left hand to eating, with, of course, the exception if there's uh, any disabilities or anything else that, that may hinder that. But with respect to the left hand having its specific uses, not that it's any less than the right hand, but that it has its specific uses and functions for our bodies and uh, with respect to how we are to clean ourselves, and that the right hand is what has been made for uh, eating and for taking in and 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 all that 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 comes into contact with these other things. Uh, Abu Jahaifa shares that the Prophet lifted up that I, as for me, while I'm eating, I don't recline. Um, and we see that when when we're sitting with the Prophet in this gathering, the Prophet would not be standing up and eating. The Prophet would not be reclining and eating. The Prophet would be uh, eating and partaking in a healthy way. But you also see that 
while reclining, a lot of times this happens to us, especially if we go to restaurants that have cushions on the floor and we just kind of sit back and maybe have a few bites or whatnot. But thinking about not just the prophetic tradition of not doing that, but then additionally, just from a medical standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, uh, scholars comment on how this uh, form of eating, if one's just reclined and and eating, it inhibits proper digestion. That it, it you, you know, you you you. You are not in a natural position when it comes to eat, and so your food uh, it flows uh, as it should, but it, it, it there's obstructions that are then created with respect to the stomach and and your uh, your GI tract and everything, and so just just healthy digestion gets inhibited. But you see, the Prophet's wisdoms behind this uh, are, are are much more beyond just personal habits. That there are so many other wisdoms for us to take away with respect to how we can properly eat that not only affects us in a way of uh you know spirituality but also from a health standpoint ibn abbas the uh, nephew of the prophet shares that the prophet and his family would spend consecutive nights extremely hungry and would not find anything to eat for supper the most common form of bread that they had and that they would eat was barley bread and we'll see a few more hadith like this that talk about how the prophet despite being who he was despite his status was someone who alongside his family would not really eat to their fill, would be people who would be hungry. And I'm not talking about the hunger that you experience in Ramadan after not eating for, you know, 10, 8, 12, 13 hours, but genuine hunger that you you don't know when your next meal is coming, that you, you are truly at uh, the mercy of Allah and you don't have uh, anything to kind of look forward to, uh, that this hunger is is one that would span days this hunger is one that would go for beyond because when it's saturated it wouldn't have you know an overabundance they didn't have like a giant pot of biryani at the end of every day that says okay we can now break our fast they had morsels and if that uh we we see aisha uh lift up that the family of muhammad sallallahu never ate their fill of barley bread two days in a row up until the soul of the prophet sallallahu was taken and that there was never any extra barley bread left in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, that they would always uh, take what they what they needed, their minimum portion, and they would finish it. There was never any of these leftovers that would be there. One, because there's not enough food just in general, but then two, also just, just seeing how the Prophet ﷺ operates, that he is someone that does not waste, he's someone that uh, is sure to take, take care uh, of, of the food and the gifts that are given him, but on, also on the flip side of it, that the Prophet in his setting here uh, was also, you know, mindful of what he ate. He wasn't just gluttonous and over-consuming whatever came in. He was very mindful of what came into his body. Uh, Masruq narrates that one day I went to visit Aisha radiallahu anha and she asked for some food to be brought to me. And then she said, I do not eat my fill of food and, and then wish to cry except that I cry. I asked, why is that? And she replied, I remember the condition in which the Prophet ﷺ left this world. By Allah, he never ate his fill of bread and meat twice in the same day. Seeing how the Prophet ﷺ never had that experience where he gives a statement like, I'm so full, I'll never eat again, or that he's completely you know, to the brim with food, that he, he never had that experience. And the people around him, when they... Uh, when they were living after he passed away, when Islam and the Muslim community started to rise in worldly ranks and prosperity, that they started to see this and and be mindful and reflect on their prophet, not who was who was who he was, not even having a percentage of that or a fraction of that, and so it caused a lot of guilt for people to kind of think that how can we do this when the Prophet was was someone who didn't even have any meal to his fill while he was alive. Uh, Simak ibn Harb narrates that I heard Norman ibn Bashir say, do you uh, to say to a bunch of companions or people who are from the second, third generation there, do you all not indulge in food and drink as much as you like? Verily, I saw your prophet at times unable to find even the lowest quality of dates with which to fill his stomach. So you see this observation that is that is made uh, that you know obviously it's come later generation money has come into the ummah that uh, Muslim 
uh, individuals are starting to rise in rank. And of course, with, with that uh, prosperity rising, there's probably a, a greater degree of food and other materials that can be accessed. And uh, Nauman ibn Mashir notices this and has a very strong reaction that how is this even possible when your prophet was someone who was, was at times just suffering from hunger and couldn't find even the basic food to eat. So how, how does that make you all feel? Sahal ibn Sa'ad was asked, did the Prophet ever eat bre uh, bread made of flour, made from fine flour? Uh, and Sahal resp responded that the Messenger of Allah did not even see fine flour until he met Allah. Then he was asked, do you have the sieves used during the time of the Prophet some sieves kind of like a you know, a, a, a dish or a pan that has like a mesh to, you know, sort the, the flour and help kind of convert something from a, a, a liquid state to a more solid state. So, you know, I'm not an expert chef or cook or whatnot, but uh, sieves basically just helps to uh, make the, uh, help facilitate the the, the flour and, and, and the uh, process by which, you know, the, the bread is made. Um, but they, he asked that then, he was asked, did you have the sieves during the time of the Master of Allah? And he replied that we didn't have sieves. And then he was asked, so how much did you, how did you make bread with barley? And he, um, who was uh, Sahel, had replied that we would blow into it and whatever large particles were in it would fly out and then we would knead the rest into dough. So you see how not just in their economy, in their in their being, in their food choices, they were, had to be frugal. They had to be careful with how they used it. Not only were they uh, in the space where they couldn't afford to buy a lot of food, but also the materials that they used. They didn't have proper materials to be able to make proper food that we may say like, oh, that's like, you know, proper bread or all this. They had to do with what they could. And as this shows that even in, in very simplistic ways, even after they, they started to become, you know, a powerful entity, they still were people that, that were doing things like this to, in order to survive. Gab ibn Malik shares that the Prophet after he would eat, he would lick his blessed fingers three times uh, after eating, um, or he would lick the three fingers, uh, which is usually the thumb, the index finger, and then the middle finger, that he would lick these um, after eating. And so to show not just, you know, apart from the worldly benefits that, that this is shown to have as well, but to also show the appreciation the Prophet ﷺ had for food and not for wasting any food, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ was very mindful. Again, he opened up his meal in thinking of Allah and starting with the name of Allah. So Allah is on the mind of the Prophet ﷺ continuously. And how can the Prophet ﷺ use this uh, this this interaction and this space of of meal eating to be a space where he can grow, where he can strengthen his faith, where he can be tested and mindful of his faith. Anas relates that verily, I had given the Messenger of Allah all his drinks with a drinking vessel. Uh, I had water. There was nabid. There was honey. There was milk. Nabid like kind of like a a water uh, that's fruit infused, but you have dates in it, and it just develops that sweetness. So see this in hotel lobbies where they have like lemons and lemon water and fruit water and all that, but just kind of with dates, uh, that the dates saturate in it. And uh, there's a sweetness that's created there uh, that you have all of these, uh, you know, all of the drinks would be in one vessel. So the Prophet ﷺ did not have a whole China cabinet or uh, an entire kitchen staff. He just had something very simple. And one of those was a drinking vessel that would have these different uh, drinks that were in it, but it also shows us what the Prophet ﷺ liked to drink, what the Prophet ﷺ would drink. Honey was there. Uh, honey, I believe that would be mixed with water or milk. Um, you have milk that's there. You have this uh, date water. Um, you have just regular water, all these things, and kept very simply. Aisha relates that the Messenger of Allah uh, stated that what and exclaimed, what an excellent condiment vinegar is. Uh, in Sahih Muslim, which is separate from the Shamail, we see that the Prophet is lifting up how this is the condiment of the prophets who came before me. And we see that apart from just the, the praise that is afforded to vinegar and, and that, that is given here, we see that the vinegar has various benefits in moderate amounts of uh, for improving digestion, for improving one's cholesterol or blood sugar levels, all these different things. And the Prophet just left it very, very generic in a sense. What what great uh, condiment, what excellent condiment vinegar is. Omar al-Khattab lifts, lifts up, Ibn al-Khattab lifts up that 
eat, uh, the Prophet commanded, eat, eat olive oil and apply its oil on you for it comes from a blessed tree. And when it's said to eat olive oil, to partake in it, it's understood not just to take a spoon of olive oil and start taking it, but to eat it with bread, to eat it with what is custom at the time. And bread was what was the staple here. And so this is understood in that context here. Anas ibn Malik related how the Prophet liked gourd, uh, which are hard-shelled fruit, and how these, uh, the, just with respect to gourd, the Prophet uh, you know, by, by partaking in it also, uh, was somebody who benefited from some of its blessings, its physiological blessings of memory, uh, improving memory, and reducing headaches, and quenching one's thirst, all these different things. And a companion once related that I went to see the Prophet ﷺ and I saw a gourd being sliced. I asked, what is that for? And the Prophet ﷺ said that we increase our, we increase our food with these slices, that yeah, this wasn't just like we take we have a gourd and we just start biting into it and we go with it, but that this is a way for us to also be uh, economical, be moderate in how we use this and how we, uh, though though we do trust that Allah will feed us, we still tie our own camel and we we do what we can to make sure that we also are prepared and it's not just completely reliant upon Allah that we trust Allah help us make these different things happen, but that at the end of the day we also take a, uh, take a chance at, uh, you know, doing what we can on our end. And Anas also shares in this aspect that uh, the messenger of Allah uh, once had a tailor who uh, invited him uh, to a meal and to participate. And so uh, Anas says that I was with the Prophet Sallallahu and to partake of that food and I went with him. The man presented the Prophet some a, a some barley bread and a broth that had pieces of gourd and dried strips meat strips of meat in it, and I saw the Prophet some seek out pieces of the gourd from the sides of the bowl, and that after that um, I loved gourd. Like you know, he talks about how he related to this, and this was a very impactful event for him. But just to think about the Prophet some having this affinity for gourd, which again, hard shaped cells, you can probably see them at your grocery store, like mini pumpkins and looking very different, like, like so many other things. And so you, you get an idea of what gourd is and what it looks like there. Aisha related how the Prophet also liked very sweet foods and honey, but not to the degree of, uh, you know, snacking or cravings, but the Prophet when these would be provided would like them. He wouldn't just sit at home and eat all day. He was he would be invited to different places. He would have his meal time, but he would be very cognizant. He would be very careful to not fall into the cravings trap that so many of ourselves, including myself, are maybe guilty of. Uh, and 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 to to be mindful of that. Abdullah bin Jafar shares how uh, the Prophet would eat a cucumber with dates. That dates were a very common part of the Prophet's diet. Of course, he was in the Medina land of the dates, but that he would always have fresh dates uh, that he, if he was eating with something, he would have uh, these fresh dates that he would oftentimes eat these other fruits or meals with. And so, as we mentioned, he would eat cucumber with fresh dates. Aisha relates that the Prophet would eat watermelon with fresh dates. Uh, Anas ibn Malik said that the Prophet would eat yellow melon with dates. So he has all these fresh dates uh, that he would eat these uh, special fruits for as well. So thinking about again, what is the how how scarce are some of these foods? Like you know, knowing what the climate of Arabia is and uh, of the Arabian Peninsula, how often would the Prophet eat this? Like how often would he have these things? And so thinking about it from that lens as well. Abdullah ibn Harat lifts up that we ate some grilled meat with the Prophet while, while in the mosque. And I like this because it just sounds like a barbecue at the masjid that's happening um, at the Prophet's time. But they had grilled meat and then they went and did their salah. And they're, you know, after that, just kind of hanging out with each other. But you see the Prophet also going from the vegetarian side, really was someone who liked meat and 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 uh, enjoyed its blessing. And Mughira ibn Sharba narrates that I was in the I was with the messenger of Allah one night as a guest at a rotated side of meat was presented to him and he took a large knife and he began to slice it and then he sliced me a piece so Prophet also maintaining this ethic of uh, preparing not just food in, in a sense but participating in it but then also giving to other people's always having that hand outstretched for how can I help you and helping other people 
regardless of who they are, where they come from, or how old they might be. Ibn Masood lifts up that uh, along the same lines of meat, the Prophet liked the foreleg of a sheep. And Aisha relates that the foreleg of the Prophet was not the most beloved portion of meat to the Prophet. However, he would not find meat except occasionally, and he would take uh, to it the foreleg quickly because it was the quickest portion to cook. Um, he also liked the shoulder, the neck, all these different areas. But you can see in Aisha's message here, very similar that the Prophet would not find meat occasionally, except in very few times, like very rare. Like this wasn't a very common thing to kind of go out and say, all right, I'm going to go get some meat. Like we sometimes do at the halal store that, oh, my, uh, you know, my, my meat, meat order is ready. That's not something that was at the advantage or at the luxury of the Prophet to have. Uh, a companion related as well that I ate the meat of a hubara uh, bustard with the, with the uh, messenger of Allah. And this is just a uh, a bird, an African you know bird. You can kind of take a look at it online. But uh, hubara bustard. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It may not. But uh, you see, the Prophet I'm also having a diverse diet. It wasn't just all grains or vegetables or soups. It was also meat. It was also uh, dates and fruits and all these different things. And so Abu Musa also relates how the Prophet would eat chicken meat. That there was a companion that walked in and had some objections, and Abu Musa corrected him, saying that you know the Prophet was someone who I witnessed eat chicken meat. Uh, Umehane uh, relates that the Prophet came to see me and asked, "Do you have anything to eat?" And I replied, "Except for some dry bread and vinegar, no." And he said, "Bring that. Bring." Uh, he said, "He said bring it. No home in which there is vinegar is bereft of a condiment." So the process of lifting this up, the people on the other end being afraid that what if we don't have enough for the process? Of what's going to happen? Like this isn't this isn't worthy of him. If someone of his stature and the process of simply uh, you know doesn't doesn't make them feel bad or anything, the process of actually says uh, for them to, to to bring what they have to, to just uh, whatever you have is there's blessing in it there even if it's just something as sim simple as bread and vinegar anas uh, relates as well that the prophet Sallam, when he held his wedding banquet with sophia he did it with some dried dates and he did it with uh sawik or a dish that's just like a porridge um, that is made from wheat or barley. So again, simple like meal. We we have very high expectations when we go to a wedding that, oh, wedding food, like, you know, very nice, like uh, buffet style, you know, all you can eat kind of plates that oftentimes are there in Muslim weddings. But the Prophet's wedding banquet with Sophia was something very simple, very blessed, but something that he, foods that he liked, dried dates and uh, this porridge that's from wheat and barley. So I mean, very simple, but something that he also was connected to. Ubaidullah ibn Ali uh, related on the authority of his grandmother, Salma, that uh, you know she was approached by some children. I believe one of them was uh, Hassan ibn Ali, uh, the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu and stated, please cook something for us that the Prophet Sallallahu would like and enjoyed eating. This is obviously maybe down the line after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has passed, but uh, you know, the Prophet uh, gave, gave us something that he liked and that he likes eating. And she said, sons, you're not going to like it. Like, you know, this is different uh, generation food and it's, it's probably not the best because of the, the conditions that they're in. But she took some of that barley um, because they, they pushed back. They said, no, we want to eat it. So she took some of that barley. She grounded it up. She put it in a pot, poured over it, uh, oil over it. And then uh, she grounded some uh, pepper and some Indian chili spices to the mix and presented it to them. This very simple dish I've just described uh, with respect to presentation, not necessarily simple and in, in being made, but a simple in presentation uh, dish. And, you know, I presented it to them saying, this is what the Prophet ﷺ liked and enjoyed eating. The Prophet ﷺ was not gluttonous. The Prophet ﷺ was not someone that just wanted to uh, you know, just just have everything his way. The Prophet made do for what was there and did not, you know, push back to to have even more done. He was he was very calm about these things and he was very appreciative in these moments. Aisha relates that uh, the Prophet would come to me and ask, "Do you have anything for breakfast?" And I would reply, "No." To which the Prophet would say, "I'm fasting." And one day he came to me and said, uh, "And I said to him, O Messenger of Allah, we've received a gift." And he said, "What was it?" And she replied that uh, it is heis. Uh, I and I and he woke up 
He said, I woke up for fasting and then he ate. Uh, but this haste is like a very sweet dish. It's a dish of dates with clarified butter and I believe it's curdled in milk. So there's, there's, it's a very sweet dish uh, if you look at, uh, or it has uh, has curdled milk, sorry, that that's with it. So you can look it up, uh, haste uh, that has, um, you know, it still comes to this day. Uh, but you see the Prophet in this aspect of, oh, he would be someone that would fast, but he would fast when there's nothing to eat. He wouldn't want people to know that he's suffering from hunger, that he is, you know, just as, if not more, thirsty and, and needing filling than they may be. And you also see on the other side of this how the Prophet, uh, as, as, you know, some scholars agree, some scholars are, you know, debate on this or forbid it, that the breaking of a voluntary fast is seen as permissible by some schools of thought and some schools say no, but they, they use a, a, you know, hadith like this for justification that the Prophet saw a meal or was given a meal. Uh, and he said that, you know, I woke up fasting and now I'm, now I'm not. So he started to eat. Uh, but also just think why the Prophet would fast, not just for the ritual purposes, the Prophet also at times would fast because there may not have been anything to eat. And so rather than complain and go in there, turning a negative into a positive. Ibn Abbas relates that when the Prophet would drink, he would uh, pause to breathe twice. We talked about this last time, how he would drink in moderation. He wouldn't just quench his thirst all at once, that this isn't a proper quenching. It takes moderation, and he does it with ease. So any drink that he would drink, he would pause to breathe twice, or he would just take it you know, uh, gradually and not just you know, gulp it all at once. Uh, Aisha relates that the most beloved of the drinks of the Prophet ﷺ were those that were sweet and cool. So uh, again, think about how the climate informs us. It's not a very forgiving place to be living in, and something that's cold in these spaces and cool uh, is a lot better than something that is scorching hot. So he really liked these uh, beverages that were refreshing, that were sweet and cool. Uh, Anas relates uh, as well at the towards the conclusion of a meal that when the Prophet ﷺ would wrap up, the Prophet ﷺ would like to eat the thufl of the meal, that that basically meaning what remains of the meal. We talked about this last time, that feels kind of like, you know, when, when you have like a burger out the bag and then some fries and what's at the bottom is just the bagglers or any of the leftovers that might be in the plate, the Prophet ﷺ would like to uh, eat what remains of a meal. There's the blessing in cleaning up the food to make sure that nothing goes to waste, but also that there is the food that is there. So again, thinking that this is a person that you come and you're sitting with him and you're eating with him, he offers you everything first. He gives you everything first before he takes from himself. And when everything is is pretty much said, you've wrapped up, that he's the person who likes to clean it up in the sense of uh, taking the, the food that we might not want to eat or the food that may go to waste. He is on that duty and vigilance of taking everything in. And so he would that would be his favorite uh, part of, uh, that would be one of the, um, favorite parts of the meal was, was the that he'd like this thufl or the, the remains of the meal. Uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri shares that the, when the Prophet ﷺ would finish his meal, he would say, all praise is due to Allah who has fed us and who has provided for us and who has provided this drink from us for us and has made us Muslims. Again, tying all these things together, that your Islam does not walk out the door the second you walk into the kitchen or the dining hall. Your Islam follows you in life through and through all these different places that uh, Abu Umama shares, when a spread of food would be removed from the Prophet's presence, that the Prophet would say, all praise is due to Allah, an abundant and pure and blessed praise, a praise that can neither be forsaken nor dispensed with our Lord. That you see continual attachment to Allah is something that was part and parcel of the Prophet and it's a fab this thread that runs through his uh, the fabric of his existence. Um, Ibn Abbas shares, and in closing, we have that the Prophet ﷺ was brought a vessel of milk to drink from. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Ibn Abbas was there, I believe Khalid ibn Walid was there, and there was uh, you know a little bit of an exchange, and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, gives him this beautiful advice that the one to whom Allah gives food should say, Oh Allah, bless us in it and give us to eat from it, from what is better, give, give us to eat from what is better than it. Uh, that Allah bless us in it, but also give us to eat from what is better than it. And the one whom Allah gives a drink of milk should say, oh Allah bless us in it and increase us in it. That there's nothing that takes the place of food and drink besides milk. That you see the Prophet still 
in incorporating within people that don't just start fighting over food. Don't just say mine's better, this, 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 all these different things. Tie it back to Allah. Keep that connection with Allah alive. And as we wrap up here for this session, we want to incorporate that as well. That if there's one thing we take away from this aspect of the Prophet's diet, it's that Allah was never absent from it. That regardless of the food the Prophet was taking in, any drink, any meal, any meat, any bread, any uh, you know sweet dish or anything like that, any vegetable, fruit, or whatever it may be, that all these things the Prophet consumed. But the Prophet also would take in the uh, the reminder of the connection to Allah. The Prophet would always give out the praise of Allah. So whatever, regardless of whatever is going in to the Prophet and is being ingested, what comes out uh, from the Prophet's mouth and from his utterances at the beginning of a meal and at the end of the meal is a constant connection to Allah throughout. And, and this is something the Prophet wanted his companions at the time to be mindful of that if they forget to say bismillah before they start eating it say it when you can and say it at the end so remember this as there but also it should uh, as we close here we should remember that the prophet was not someone who had you know trays and tables like you know lined out for him of food and in an abundance the prophet lived in a very simple setup a very impoverished setup the prophet never ate to his fill uh, in 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 a given day or a to, or two days in a row or anything like that, the Prophet was someone who who was hungry. The Prophet was someone who uh, felt that the aspects of starvation, felt the aspects of hunger, felt real thirst, felt these things, despite being the person chosen as the most blessed example, the most perfect model for humanity, despite being, you know, this, this mantle of mercy that he was, despite being this individual, he still felt some of the harshest realities in this earth. And it tells us that food and, and these worldly possessions are not the object of our existence. They are not what we live for. Um, they help us to continue to live, but they are not the center of our focus. And for the Prophet of some, uh, this was not at the center of his focus, but when it did come, he found a way to tie it directly back to Allah. So we ask Allah to, in our next meal or anything that we next eat, that we are mindful of how uh, the Prophet was of Allah, and that we are mindful that each of these things that have been given to us have come from nowhere else except through Allah, and that these become a means for us to not just connect back to Allah, but connect to our spirituality, connect to our identity as Muslims, and to be better people because of our realizations. Inshallah, until next time, we'll be talking about the uh, Prophet in, in our next session. And so till then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.